Hello, welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. When I was a kid, I would watch all the natural history shows I could find, and the most prominent one then was uh, Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom. The anaconda exerts fantastic pressure. I could see in that show a little glimpse of what professional wildlife people do. Eight feet is our target for a study of these giants. The fun parts and the parts of actually being out in the wild and doing something to help conserve uh, an element of nature. The leader of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service research team, Steve Amstrup. In the uh, 1970s, I actually got to do a film with Marlon Perkins. So here I was, uh, you know, somewhat 20 years later, I was able to actually stand on the same ground, shake his hand, and go out and make a movie with this guy who I had watched when I was a kid. Of course, the four-month-old cubs are a bit frightened, but they've never been handled before. Captivated by bears as a child, Dr. Stephen Amstrup first focused on black bears and pronghorn antelope for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. In 1977, he was presented a daunting challenge. Study the largest of all bears in one of the most inhospitable environments on the planet. Initial research focused on the first comprehensive polar bear population count using technologies which Amstrup worked throughout the 1980s to perfect. Perfect, right in the rum. I viewed the polar bear and being able to study polar bears as the ripest plum in the profession. We could fly out and we could indeed catch bears and you could weigh them and measure them and, and things like that. But we had no idea how they moved, how they utilized their habitat. 191 pounds. I said, we need to figure out how we can radio collar these guys. This collar will transmit signals to a satellite that will record all movements of the bear. He was really a pioneer and saw the need and went and developed the technology for satellite tracking of polar bears out in the polar basin, which is now pretty much off the shelf and everybody uses it. The data Amstrup cultivated played a key role in the re-ratification of the International Polar Bear Treaty, which creates limits on the harvesting of polar bears. His 1992 status paper showed that populations were stabilizing. But almost simultaneously, another problem was becoming apparent. It was getting harder and harder to get out in the fall. The sea ice was freezing up ever later, ever later. And the first time it happened, we thought, well, you know, this is just kind of a fluke. But by the late 90s, it was pretty clear that this was a progressive pattern, that it was getting worse and worse and worse. Breakup of the sea ice is a full three weeks earlier than it was only 30 years ago. That's horrendous. Bears are lighter. They're having fewer cubs. The cubs aren't surviving as well. The populations are declining become increasingly clear that the habitat isn't stable. Due to global warming, the warming environment has less sea ice. As the sea ice blinks out, so will the polar bears. This perilous change in the environment caused Amstrup to make a radical shift in focus to prove his observations scientifically. He led a group of scientists in a U.S. geological survey culminating in a 2007 report that changed everything. What we found was that we could probably lose two-thirds of the world's polar bears in the next 50 years, and perhaps lose them all in 100 years. The documents Steve prepared ended up becoming the primary foundation of the decision to list polar bears under the United States Endangered Species Act. Some of the first media that came out of that listing was that the situation was hopeless. And Steve was devastated because that's not what he wanted to convey to the public at all. And it's not what he believed. Motivated to prove that the effects of warming in the Arctic are indeed reversible, Amstrup and his team studied trends in temperatures in key polar bear habitats. The findings were published in a 2010 article in Nature magazine, a landmark for Amstrup. He brought hope by being able to scientifically prove that the ice will come back. But the individuals need to do something about it, and they need to feel all part of it. When it was published, that it was well received, that was the affirmation 
that he had done the right thing. Global climate change is a conservation issue, not for a single species. It's going to change everything. And what Stephen really tries to do is create that call to action so that everybody is going to want to get involved with that. There really is hope. And it's going to take some work, but there really is hope. And so when people really ask fortunate. who Steve is, I tell them he is the most dedicated person to conservation on the planet. It's a passion with him. You know, as long as there's hope, he will burn the candles at both ends. And there's hope. Polar bears have captured the human imagination from the earliest of times. And recognizing now that polar bears can help us carry a message about what we need to do to preserve a climate on Earth that we can continue to thrive in, to me that was the best news of all because there is still time to save polar bears. That's what Steve keeps bringing through and reminding us every day. We cannot give up. It's too important.